Carmel Johnston é uma jovem cientista da NASA que comandou uma equipa de cientistas na missão High Seas 4. Durante um ano estiveram em absoluto isolamento numa estação instalada no Havaí, numa simulação do que será uma verdadeira missão a Marte. Para vos dar dois exemplos, tudo se passava como se estivessem de facto no planeta vermelho. Sempre que saíam da estação tinham de usar os fatos de astronauta e respirar pela garrafa, e as comunicações com a base tinham uh, um diferencial, um delay de 7 minutos, que é uh, o cálculo que é feito uh, para a, a demora de comunicações entre a Terra e Marte. É este o ponto de partida, então, para a primeira apresentação do dia. Carmel, let's go to Mars! Password accepted. <risos> A couple weeks ago, some friends and I went backpacking in Montana's Glacier National Park. We had been planning this trip since January, but in the weeks prior to our departure, we found that one thing after another started popping up as a roadblock. At first, a wildfire blocked the entire western side of the park, and so we couldn't go out that original exit. So we came up with an alternative exit, but then another wildfire popped up and blocked that exit. And then a third wildfire popped up and blocked the entire middle section of our trip. So we were thinking, you know, we just can't go any further. And then a snowstorm was forecast for the entire area. So at that point, we thought, you know, maybe there's just enough signs we aren't supposed to be going on this trip. So we came up with a backup, backup, backup plan to go to an entirely different region. And as the luck would have it, the original trip came up and was available again, because sometimes all you need is a snowstorm to damper a wildfire. So our major motivation for going on this trip was threefold. The first was that it was supposed to be the most beautiful part of the park. You can't argue that this isn't pretty. Uh, the second was that it was an area that had been studied for glacial retreat for over 100 years. So we wanted to see the glaciers before they were gone completely. And the third was that I had never been there before, so I was really excited to go somewhere new. As the most experienced person in our group, I became the de facto leader. And so I had a couple considerations before going. The first was that one of the members of our group had never been backpacking before, and so she was very apprehensive. Not only had I convinced her to go hiking further than she'd ever hiked before, but I told her she had to wear a backpack that was really heavy at the same time. The second was that, well, I knew where we were supposed to be going, and I knew about how long it was supposed to take us to get there. I didn't really know anything about the trail. I just hadn't been there yet before. And so I didn't know what to tell my crewmates for what, the, what to expect for the trail, about how steep it would be, how brushy it would be. And the question we get asked the most, how many bears we were going to encounter? They're animals. I don't know. So we set out for our trip, and the first night we camped in rain. And that's just enough to like demoralize you a little bit to begin with. But we woke up in the clouds, and we were not able to see the mountains. So I didn't really know what to tell my friends for what they were going to expect. So we decided to go hiking anyways. What else can we find? So we hiked about 12 miles up the trail until we started going in, up an incline. And as we hiked steeper and steeper up this mountain pass, we found that at first there was just a little bit of snow on the side of the trail. And then there was a lot of snow on the side of the trail. And then the trail was flooded, and then it got cold. So our feet got wet, and we were really cold. And at that point, our newbie was exhausted. I couldn't do anything to convince her that she really did want to keep going. So we took a rest, and we came up with some songs and dances to get her motivated. And then we came across a wild berry patch. And I don't know if you guys experience wildberry patches like we do, but they're a huge motivating factor for moving forward because you get a little bit of fructose in your system and you just want to keep going again. So we got her up, we got hiking, and our luck changed completely because as we got to our campsite, the sun came out. So our mission into this wilderness was nowhere near what explorers will find in the future. We are a pale blue planet that's hurling through space. And explorers before us have all been interested in knowing where we fit on this planet as well as where we fit into our galactic surroundings. The Vikings, European explorers, and astronauts all have the same goal in mind to find out where we fit in. 
The only difference is now that astronauts have the potential to be able to go off of this planet. So if you can imagine going hiking in the wilderness or going on a mission to Mars, it's only a matter of time before something goes wrong. Whether something breaks or something um, causes them to have an argument, it's only a matter of time. So I lived in a very unique microcosm on Earth. From August of 2015 to August of 2016, myself and five other people lived in the Hawaii Space Exploration Analog and Simulation Dome on the Big Island of Hawaii. For an entire year, this was our view out into the world. It looks a little bit like Mars. So the entire dome that we lived in was 111 square meters, about half the size of this stage. And the six of us lived in there, and it consisted of our kitchen, our living room, our di dining room, our common spaces, two bathrooms, and six individual bedrooms. It's not a lot of space. And so the purpose of this mission was to study all of the effects, the social and psychological effects, of isolation and confinement on human beings with the constraints of going to Mars. And so NASA and the High Seas Project wanted to know what happens when we stick a bunch of guinea pigs in a dome. So they stuck us in a dome, we locked the door, and then they drove away. They didn't do anything intentionally to stress us out. The thing is that life is stressful enough as it is. You don't have to intentionally create simulations for things to malfunction or to intentionally pick people to be annoying. They already exist. And so we didn't have anything intentionally go wrong, but as you would know, things do happen. And so um, as we went through the year, we found that there were a, a lot of effects that we were not being able to forecast ourselves. So one of the things that we did while we were in the dome was we tried to live like future astronauts. Now, we didn't have to live like Mark Watney because the act of rationing and uh, resource conservation can be applied seriously enough without having to um, use the water recycling machine that cost, cost them over a million dollars. And so we were using our resources wisely. We were completely solar powered, and so that was a huge stressor for us because we were trying to um, always pay attention to daylight and our power generation curves in order to survive. So despite living, needing, not needing to live like Mark Watney, we did a lot that was like Mark Watney. So we explored the area around us and we mapped all of the geology around us. We were harvesting water off of rocks and we also spent a lot of time growing plants in marsh and regolith soil. Having tasty, crunchy green things is a really big motivating factor for crews when you have something to look forward to at the end of the day. Now, don't get me wrong, you can do amazing things with freeze-dried, dehydrated, and powdered ingredients, and both my crew and my hiking partners will attest to the fact that you can make great things like pizza and um, quiches, or you can make ice cream as long as you know how to cook. Um, it's not freeze, like astronaut freeze-dried ice cream, it's real ice cream. Um, so having that motivating factor of having something good to eat at the end of the day is really important for our crew, as well as like when you're hiking and having a wild berry patch. It just is a good motivator. And we could tell that on the days that we did not get to have a nice meal, whether we were in low power mode or we were um, not able to produce enough energy to, to cook a nice meal, the crew wasn't operating at full capacity. Even having things like fresh plants or flowers was a huge motivating factor. So on a planet here on Earth where we normally value monetary items and material possessions, our crew's most important resources were energy, water, space, and time. So space is an important factor because everyone needs to have a little space that is their own. Living in a space that's about half the size of this stage is not very large, and you can imagine that sound travels quite easily. So on the International Space Station, there's a constant hum of noise all the time, and we had that as well. So finding a quiet space was something that we were always fighting for. With six people and an infinite, or in a finite number of places where you can go and hide, and an infinite number of activities you could do, it just becomes an overwhelming environment of stimuli. You have people that are trying to cook food while others are trying to do research, or you have people trying to sleep while others are exercising, or you have people trying to play music and 
relax at the same time, and music and relaxing don't always go hand in hand. And so finding a nice, quiet place where you could have to yourself was a luxury that we all fought to preserve and protect. One of the benefits of going to Mars is that you will have a 37-minute longer day than you have here on Earth. And while we could not live with that because we were still living on Earth and that would mess up our light and night, light, night, light and night cycles, we um, would have loved to have had an extra 37 minutes of getting stuff done time. Because everything about our lives was geared towards weighing a cost of resources versus other resources. So if you need to wash your clothes, do you throw your clothes in the washing machine and use 120 liters of water? Or do you have to hand wash them and it only uses six liters of water, but you have to spend an hour of your time doing that? Do you have time and energy to run on the treadmill or do you need to use the bicycle? Or do you have power to cook your food and grow your plants or do you have to use some other resource? So these were um, questions that we were asking ourselves every day, but ultimately fell on me as the commander. When we did get free time, we like to spend it corresponding with friends and family or working on personal projects, exercising. And this was really important time for us. But one thing that we found was that between Earth and Mars, the actual distance between it requires that there's a 20 minute delay in communication. So if you send a message here from Earth, it would take 20 minutes for it to get to Mars. We lived with that delay as well. And so we would write a message, it would take 20 minutes to get to whoever we sent it to, they had to decide to reply back to us, that was a big part of it, and then it would take 20 minutes to get back to us again. So this delay caused a huge lag in our ability to communicate. It was very revealing about how you can communicate with people. Because one-on-one, -on -one, communication is quite easy because you get an instant feedback. But when you have this entirely different dimension of people who can't see you and can't communicate in, re in real time, it becomes a very real obstacle and it's something we need to consider when we're going to Mars. So one of my favorite parts about living in the dome was that it motivated me to have an inspiration to design my own sustainable house someday. So we lived with um, the solar power array that you see behind me and that was able to generate enough power for us for every day that we lived there. When we had sunny Hawaiian days, we would do everything that was energy intensive at one time. We would run on the treadmill, we would cook all of our food, we would grow our plants, and we would um, do everything we could to utilize that resource that we were not able to store. It was in excess of what we were able to keep. And then on cloudy days, we would go into low power mode, and we would preserve everything that we had. We had to keep our habitat running, but we would use as little as we could in order to be able to make it through to the next sunny day. We also had a solar water heater that is um, on the side of the building. And these things are amazing. I don't know if you have them here or not, but this was my first introduction to solar water heaters, and they are incredible. They could produce enough hot water for us for everyone to take a shower, as long as you're mindful of how long your shower is. So we were able to take about one to two minutes of showers a week, which was plenty because, you know, what, after two minutes, are you really showering yourself anymore? And so we weren't really limited by the hot water, we were limited by any water. And this was an important consideration because when you're going to a future planet, you really don't have a lot of resources to spend. And so it took us a little bit of time to get used to it, a couple days or a week. But once we did, we got used to the solar power and their limited water supply. We didn't have any other options, so that's the only way we could live. What if we all on this planet Earth switched to more renewable resources, whether it was, the, whether it was solar water or it was um, wind power? What if we consumed less water and produced wastewater? Now, that would take a lot of time to adjust to, but I think that we would all be capable of doing it. And there's probably a lot of companies that wouldn't be very happy, but if they were smart, they would be thinking ahead and they would be working on this before it actually becomes a reality. There's a lot of questions that we can answer about space here on Earth. If we are working on producing solar power here, we can use what we learn here to build better solar for Mars. And if we're thinking about cropping systems on Mars, we can produce a bunch of food systems that would work here and would be able to be, allow us to live more sustainably here versus having to wait for a food shortage. 
Now, that's going to be really complicated to figure out because humans and their relationships are very complex, quirky, and susceptible to pressure and time. Now, I can honestly say living in the dome changed my life, and I do not wish to repeat it any time in, in the near future, but everything we learned was important for making lives better for astronauts. I do think that the researchers secretly wanted us to fail because they wanted to know what's the limit of what we're capable of. But what they found was that we were really resilient and we were able to endure a lot more than they ever thought we could. And so um, when you consider what the researchers were thinking of, they wanted to know how we were gonna get along. They didn't care if we argued, they just wanted to know how we moved forward. And that was important when we considered that we were living in an isolated, confined space with a lot of things that were stressing us out over a long period of time. And so stress is important to us, and that was one of my favorite research projects because I was really interested to know how stress was affecting me. So we have external forces of stresses where we have the research team telling us stuff that we're supposed to do, and we are having to talk with our friends and family, we need to exercise, we need to cook our food, we need to just live. And we also have internal stresses where you are trying to manage your time and you're trying to fit everything in. And it definitely becomes challenging when you have more things to do in your day than you have time to do it. It can begin to wear on you and maybe it'll make you consider that you are not maybe doing as, as good of a job as an individual and as a leader, even if you're doing the best you possibly can. So isolation and confinement feed off of each other. Physically removing yourself from society is challenging. We chose to leave society and to live in this dome for an entire year. And our friends and family agreed to let us go, but they didn't really understand what we were getting ourselves into. And so we found that a lot of people stopped talking to us. We felt completely forgotten because they did not correspond the way that we had expected them to. We were also very lucky though to have one person. Each one of us had one person who stepped it up and became our connection back to earth. For me, that was my mom because she wrote me every single day. And sometimes I wonder if she had nothing better to do, but I know she did. And so for her, that was a huge commitment because I know how long it takes her to type messages as well as to upload photos. But it was something she did because she cared about me and she knew that I needed a connection to home. She was my connection to home. She was my connection to a place here on earth that wasn't gonna be the same when I returned, but it was going to be something I could look forward to nonetheless. We were all very thankful and very fortunate to have at least one person that did that. And I hope that future astronauts will also have the same because it's something that you can't live without. So confining yourself to a small space as well is something that will begin to erode on your morale as well. And so, this 111 square meters we lived in really becomes a lot of together time. You just can't get away from each other. You end up spending all of your time with the same people and they end up forming the so social structures that you would have had in your own life back at home. So our crew, even though we were six researchers and scientists, really became more of a mother and father, a sister and brother and an aunt and uncle. And so you don't get to pick who your friends are, you don't get to pick who you play games with or dance with, and there isn't really any escape, unless you want to go on an EVA or an extravehicular activity, which are amazing, and I could talk for an hour just about how awesome EVAs are, but I won't. Um, and so when you get to go on an EVA, you have to wear your spacesuit, but you don't get to feel any of the luxuries of Earth. You don't get to feel the sunshine or the wind, and that's the one thing that would have reminded us back of home but we couldn't have it because we're confined to a spacesuit. So when you're stuck in the dome or you're stuck in your spacesuit, you can never really escape work. You're always at work all the time. And there's always something to do because there's another email to write, there's something to fix, there's something to cook, there's another thing that you have to prepare for for the next day or the next week. There's always something to do. That's how it is here on Earth too. There's always something to do. I don't know how people are ever bored. But um, what we found was that it was really challenging to take a break and relax. Because when you and your coworkers cannot leave your office, you always find something to do. And then you add time. So all of this is stressful and it begins to compound over time. But 
when you um, have the isolation and confinement, you begin to wonder what effect that's actually having on you as a human being. So I like to think of the dome as geology and metamorphic rocks. So if you have a normal structure of rock and you expose it to pressure and time, you end up with something that's completely different than what you had before. And that was the same for us as a crew as well. Sometimes with metamorphic rocks, it ends up that those rocks are stronger than they were before. And whether we came out of the dome stronger or weaker or any combination of the in between, it didn't matter because it was all data. Whether we came out with six people or we came out with eight people or five people, whether, no matter if we had thrown our hands in the air in the middle of the mission, it all would have been information that the researchers at NASA can use to improve their selection process and also create happier, healthier humans in the future. So this is really challenging, though, because if we're going to go to space, um, space is difficult to go to. Since we started shooting things at Mars in the 1960s, more than half of missions have failed. And so when um, we think about getting off of this planet, sending a huge hunk of metal with fuel into space, that is um, really challenging. People like SpaceX are working on developing more renewable ways of using their rockets in order to be able to close the gap on how much time and money it costs to launch things into space. Getting humans through space, landing them there safely, is also challenging. Every time we try a new landing, we're trying something new. Once we get them there to Mars, we are going to have to allow them to survive. And so whether you have them living in modular habitats or you have them live in lava tubes, it's really important to consider all the things that want to kill them. The temperature, the pressure, the atmosphere, um, everything wants, to, in the effects of low gravity, everything wants to erode at human beings. We also need to consider particulate matter and aliens, all the good things that want to kill us. So um, there are lots of people out there that are working on designing habitats and space modules for us to go in. Maybe some of you people here in the audience are working on that as well. And it's important to consider that humans evolved here on Earth. Everything about us as humans, our eyes, our bones, and our muscles, our blood, everything was evolved and adapted for Earth. But Mars does not have those same conditions. So we need to consider that human beings, if we're going to survive there, need to have an entirely different life support system there than we have here. But none of this matters unless we can learn to get along. We're all pieces of this big puzzle that is going to form how we get to another planet in order to be able to survive better here on Earth. Now, this puzzle isn't a really easy puzzle because it has seven billion pieces and it's got a bunch of curvy edges, but what do you do when you don't have the box? We have no image of what this puzzle is supposed to look like. You start on the edge pieces. You start on an edge of pieces that uh, are people who are living in simulations and all of the researchers that are working on finding out the human component of how we live in space and how we can create ha happier, healthier humans. We have edge pieces of people that are designing the habitats and are going to protect us and keep us safe when we get there. And we have edge pieces of all of the astronauts who are living and trying to develop the skills that they need in order to survive there when, someday when they do get to be shot to Mars. And once we have all these edge pieces, we can start to work on the middle. So each piece is connected to another piece, and we can't get to the middle to see what this image looks like without connections and without getting along. I truly think that we can learn to get along, or I truly think we can do anything if we learn to get along and we stop fighting each other here. So maybe if we took some time to form one group of humanity, one thing that unites all of us, one big team here on Earth, we can learn to lead a better humanity both here on Earth and beyond the stars. Thank you. Thank you.